Nehemiah, part five. Pray to God, cause he's number one. He is your guide and will get the job done. Nehemiah was Kibera, Kibera to the king. The right place, the right time to do his thing. His people were in trouble, the walls were down. But God was not, let's rebuild this town. Pray to God, cause he's number one. He is your guide and will get the job done. Every single person played their part. Rebuilding the walls, it was such a good start. Brick by brick, the walls were rising. Teamwork makes the dream work, that's not surprising. Pray to God, cause he's number one. He is your guide and will get the job done. The walls were getting higher, only door gaps remained. But they were facing trouble, some wanted them to fail. Nehemiah was a prayer, prayed all the day. And God was in charge and he will get his way. Pray to God, cause he's number one. He is your guide and will get the job done. Nehemiah was given the strength and wisdom to conquer his fears and the fears of his nation so that the Lord's work might be completed through prayer and faith we are not defeated with God and Nehemiah being such a good pair nothing that came could separate or scare Nehemiah was a faithful man the walls were up again but all the glory goes to God peace out Amen So today, uh, we're going to focus on that last line of the rap that says, but all the glory goes to God. Peace out, our men comes afterwards, but all the glory goes to God. In everything we do, in every action, in every word, in every deed, in every thought, we aim to glorify God, to bring glory to his name. But I want to have a little think about what that actually means, to bring glory to his name. Because the verse that goes with that is in Colossians 3.17, it says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So in the Old Testament, glory came to mean a sense of splendor and majesty. It was synonymous with saying how amazing God is. But in the New Testament, glory came to mean being given dignity or worth, honor, praise, and worship. So when we combine these two things together, we end up doing something for God that means recognizing who he is, his majesty, and his splendor and giving him the appropriate honor and worth because he alone deserves our praise and worship. Now here's the tricky thing that I found. God already has all the glory. He has already got the victory. So how do we give him glory as if he doesn't already possess it? as if this is something that we can provide him with. When we give God the glory, we are agreeing or affirming to something that is already true. Giving him glory is not something we give to God, like as if it was a possession to give away, but rather acknowledging something that God already possesses, already is, or has. I'll explain that slightly differently. In my life, I have always known God as a provider. I've always known God as a provider God. That can be in times of financial trouble, which we have had as a family, or in times of difficulty. God has always provided for our needs, even if we haven't kept the faith. Whether I gave the glory to God for those times or not, 
he was still the provider. That didn't change. He provided. But what does change is whether I ascribe to God the credit for it and the honor or the praise he deserves or whether I claim that for myself. So um, we're just going to have a look at these um, past couple of weeks and see how all of that applies in the weeks that we've learned. In week one, we learned that Nehemiah had a close relationship with God. He went to God first, both in the good times and the bad. He was in tune with God. He recognized the splendor and majesty of God. He recognized that he was in charge in all situations. He knew that God was the only one that could give him the answers he needed in prayer when his people and city were in trouble. He knew that God was in charge. His glory will be revealed if Nehemiah listened to him. And then in week two, uh, we learned that God gave Nehemiah a vision to rebuild the walls. And we read from the passages that Nehemiah needed God's guidance and strength when he approached the king. He recognized that he was unable to do this in his own strength. He recognized God's superior ability or supernatural ability to give him the strength and wisdom he needed. So in week three and four, we learned about how everyone's gifts were valued and were used in the rebuilding of the walls. Everyone played their part. And all these gifts were given to them by God. They followed Nehemiah because they knew he was the chosen leader. But he was the chosen leader because God had made him that. Nehemiah never took for himself the glory of what was being achieved. People knew he prayed regularly to God, knew that the vision had come from God, knew that they were rebuilding something more than just their walls. This was a rebuilding of people, too, of their nation back to its uh, power and strength as it once was. And then week five had us looking at the struggles that they faced, the enemies that presented themselves. But again, Nehemiah was not defeated by them because God was on his side. He was fighting for him. In Nehemiah chapter 6, it talks about the walls being finished in 52 days, which I think is actually an incredible achievement, 52 days. And the outside nations being afraid because they knew that God was in the rebuilding of these walls. And they didn't have a chance of defeating them with God on their side. God has been around forever, right? A really long time. So he has seen over the history of time the struggles of his people. He knows that he has the ultimate victory and therefore enemies will be defeated. The thing I'm not saying is that that not, might, might not be in the way that we exactly expect or it might not be in the way we pray about, but they will be defeated because God is for us. He was for Nehemiah and he is for us. Now in those five weeks, we've learned that God is in every part of this story. None of this was possible without God. So 1 Timothy 1.17 says this, All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. The glory belongs to him because all glory belongs to him. The moment we begin to glorify ourselves. We put our faith and our trust in ourselves to do things, to sort things out, to fix things, to see what needs to be done. Things start to go wrong. But if we are in line with God, we think the same things, we act the same way, see the way, the works, I see the world the way God does. In Psalm 115, one, it says, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. I want, and Nehemiah wanted, 
all the glory to go to God. When I reflect on um, all those characteristics of God, I want people to see in him, not me. When I'm kind, I want people to see that I'm kind because God is kind to me. When I'm generous, I want people to see that I'm able to be generous because God was to me first. When I'm humble, when I'm faithful, when I'm honest, when I'm good, when I'm loving, when I'm true, I want people to recognize these as characteristics that I have because they are characteristics that come from God. Nehemiah may have physically had the vision, spoken to the king, got the tools, the workers, set the workers to work, spoken to the enemy, but it was a God at work in him that achieved the victory. Nehemiah wanted the name of the Lord lifted high, not his own. He wanted God's people to be united within the walls. He wanted Jerusalem to be a beacon shining and reflecting God's glory to all around so that God would be lifted high. Now, I have read uh, later on, and things aren't perfect. Things go wrong, okay? But God is still, if we go to him first, he will be the one who can sort it out again. So in chapter 8, the wall has been built and the, wall, the people have all gathered. And what did they do next? Was that, did you ask, what, was my, what was the answer? Ah, well, of sorts, yeah. I've read all of it. Um, but in uh, verse 1, it says this. All the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the law had commanded for Israel. And in verse 8, it says, they read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving meaning so that people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. And then verse 18 says, day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days. So in those four verses, we see that they put God at the center. They read from the word of God. They attribute the success of the mission to God. God achieved the victory. God crushed the enemy. The glory belongs to God. Will Skelton, an Australian rugby player, rugby player once said this. I'm a big believer in Jesus Christ. I'm a big believer that he gave me the gifts to glorify his name. When I train or play, I try to glorify him. So if we recognize God's majesty and splendor so much that we end up giving him the honor and worth that is due his name because he and he alone deserves our praise and worship. We want Jesus and God's name lifted high. We want the glory to go to them. So my two final questions for you, I told you it was short. How are we going to glorify God today? How are you? How are I? How are we going to glorify God today? And the question that we've been asking you the whole way through, what is your superhero mission? We'll have one collectively as a church. We will have them individually as well. So what's your superhero mission today? <laughs>